Everybody there? Anybody need me to wait? All right. Should be an easy book to find. All right. If, uh, if any of you are in an ESV, I'm going to be reading from the New King James. You'll find the ESV to be a little bit different. It's actually a little bit more accurate, so it's a pretty good translation if you're in there. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that they are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. You may be seated. All right, our series is The Real Church. Um, we're in church number five. This is probably the worst church. This is the dead church. That phrase, dead church, um, is used today, I believe, in the wrong way. Um, usually when somebody says, uh, that church is dead, they make the mistake of looking at activity. Um, they make the mistake of thinking that if there is jumping and shouting in the church that that church is alive and if you were to go downtown to just just say I'm just going to use them as an example First Baptist Dallas because when the preacher preaches everyone's quiet they would say well that church is dead I'm telling you that church is alive we make the mistake of misunderstanding what it means to be an alive church. If you've been with us as we've been going through this series, especially when we got to this part where we've been looking at these seven churches, you've begun to realize that overall, if there's seven churches, and if only two of them are getting it right, and five of them are getting it wrong, that there's a lot of wrong going on in church. There's a lot that Jesus would not be happy with. What we're going to see today is, is that, um, I want to be nice when I say this, most of what we think is right is absolutely wrong. We're going to be able to see that today. So we are in Sardis. Sardis is about 40 miles to the south of, Th of Thyatira. That's where the last message that we came from was left off. So we're making this, clock this uh, clockwise motion as we go through that area of Asia Minor. And this is in a unique city because it is a double city in that there is a peninsula on a 1,500-foot high cliff, and there's a city up on that peninsula. And at some point, they put below on both sides of the peninsula another part of the city. So there is an upper and a lower part of the city. If you were to go there today, there's nothing there. Uh, it's a bunch of ruins. It had a glorious past. It was the capital of Lydia, and it was extremely rich. In fact, they, the, the legend says that they found gold in the river that runs down below the cliff, and, and that is how they became so wealthy, and they were, they were riding high. It's been about 30 years since the church was established there. We don't know where the church or who started it. We figure since Ephesus is only about 50 miles away, when, when Paul started the church in Ephesus, that it spread out, and, and that's how it got through Asia Minor, and it, and it hit Sardis, and a church was established there. Um, the key here to understanding Sardis is Sardis is a lot like the Dallas Cowboys. Because by the time the Romans 
um, get Sardis. Sardis has had an earthquake and it's nothing. And Caesar comes in and he rebuilds it. And when he rebuilds it, it regains some of its luster, but it's still in decline. It's been declining and declining, but they've been living off of their reputation. That's why I say they a lot like the Dallas Cowboys. So, um, you know, living off the reputation. And so the church itself is a mirror of the city in that evidently it had a good start. But after 30 years, um, things have gotten progressively worse. Uh, what you don't find when we talk about this particular church is there's no mentions of the Nicolaitans. There's, there's no mention of bad doctrine. There's no mention of false teaching. There's no mention of any persecution. None of that. That's not the problem. There's no mention of any emperor worship, even though it was there. There's, there's no mention of them being poor or suffering or any of that. In fact, when you go back and look at the city of Sardis, it was what we would call an easygoing city. It was known for its debauchery. I'm sorry. It was known for partying. It was known for having a... what secular folks call a good time all right it was known for its sin what was interesting about the city is though it had a preoccupation with death death and and reincarnation death and being raised from the dead uh, they believed that if if you died you could go to some hot springs that were a couple of miles outside the city and you could put the dead body in there and the dead body might come back alive they were, they were really hopeful in that aspect of things. Um, apparently, when the Romans got to them, they became wealthy because they were the first ones to evidently mint a coin, and they were the first ones to dye wool, and that is how they, you know, made their living. But the people thrived on riotous living, individualism. If you don't know what individualism is, this, let me explain this to you and see if this sounds familiar. That is where you be and do what you want to do, however you be and do whatever you want to be, as long as whatever you be and do doesn't affect me. Does that sound familiar? Do we not live in a world like that today? You know, individualism, whatever you want to be, you can be, even if it doesn't equate to reality. I'm a cat. And you can't tell me I'm not a cat because I feel like a cat. I identify with a cat. Isn't that the world we live in? And political ideology. They were really into political ideology. They aligned themselves from a political perspective amongst a lot of different things that were going on with them politically. Does that sound like us? Right? Um, so, Let's dive in and see what Jesus has to say. First, let's look at him, the speaker. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Seven spirits of God. Now, um, whatever version of the Bible you're looking in, most likely the word spirits is capitalized. They're trying to help you. But I want you to open your Bible and I want you to turn to chapter 4 verse 5 and I want you to look we're going to identify the seven spirits of God because as we know there's only one the Holy Spirit right all right everybody there chapter 4 verse 5 and from the throne proceeded lightnings thunderings and voices seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God wow flip over to chapter 5 verse 6 and I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth there's a little help right here in, in the fact that the, in, the, in the first instance I see that there are these lamps of fire what do lamps do they illuminate 
all right? They illuminate. They allow you to see. And then in, the, in, in chapter 5, we see that the lamb, which is, is, is the representative of Jesus, has these seven eyes. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. And, and, and it says that these are sent out into this. means he can see out into the entire world. Well, if you understand that Jesus is there, but his Holy Spirit is here in the world, he can see everything that's going on through his spirit. So we have this number of seven of completion, and we can begin to identify this as the Holy Spirit, but what is it with this number seven? All right, find Isaiah and find chapter 11. And for those of y'all that have been with us as we've been going through Isaiah, you should remember this. I say that. And I know what you're saying. We were probably in Isaiah chapter 11. Was that, was that man, was that over a year ago? Yeah, it was. Now your pages, I'm going to let you get there because I want you to see it. One. Everybody there? All right. There shall come forth from a rod from the stem of Jesse. Y'all should know that this is Jesus. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Verse two. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, what spirit of the Lord rested upon Christ? The Holy Spirit. Now, now it is called, first of all, the spirit of the Lord. Then he says the spirit of wisdom and understanding. That's three. The spirit of counsel, that's four. And might, that's five. The spirit of knowledge, that's six. And of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord, that's seven. That is a sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit. So when you see this number seven, we are talking about the Holy Spirit. Come back to Revelation chapter three. The reason that Jesus here pulls from chapter one this description that he gave of himself in chapter one in chapter three as he does with each of the churches he pulls out a piece of it there is something behind the fact that he is saying he has the holy spirit we're going to see that momentarily but i will give you a hint if you have the holy spirit you are something if you don't you are something else all right um in fact turn back Turn to chapter 1 of Revelation and, and go to verse 4. I, I, want, I want, want you to take a look at this. Um, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. All right, from him who is and who was and who is to come. That is another way of saying from him who is eternal. So we're talking about someone who is eternal, which would be God. All right. So we got God the father identified there and from the seven spirits which are before his throne they're the seven spirits we've identified that as the holy spirit and from jesus christ the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kingdoms of the earth what we have identified there is god the father god the son and god the holy spirit all right and the identification there helps us to understand we are talking about the holy spirit this is extremely important. Now come back to chapter three. And then he says in, in this first verse that the one that is speaking, these things says he who has, notice the word has, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So he has the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the, the way this is written in the original text, it means he has and he has control of. For those of you that are saying, are you saying the son has control of the spirit? Yes, because although they are equal within the Trinity, the spirit submits. All ladies say that word, submits. I'm messing with someone in particular in here that doesn't like that word. But, but uh, I want all you ladies to say that. I want y'all to, ah. I want y'all to know that even within the Trinity, there is submission. All right, so the spirit submits to the son and to the father. So he says that he has control of that, but it says, and he also has control of the seven stars. The seven stars, chapter one, verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars. When you go down to verse 20, he explains the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The angels of the seven churches are the pastors, we would say, of the seven churches. And by him saying I, that, that he has them, he's saying, I'm in control of the Holy Spirit and the pastors. I'm in control. Y'all may have missed that. I'm going to help you out with what, what, what makes a church dead. 
one of the first things that'll dead a church. Y'all like the way I said that. Yeah, well, first ways you're going to dead a church is when the pastor is not being controlled by Jesus. That'll dead a church quick. Because typically that means the pastor's the focal point. Y'all don't want that. I hope you don't want me to be the focal point. I know I don't want me to be the focal point. You know, I don't care what my wife says. She ain't here. I don't care. Well, she going to see the recording. So she'll hit me in the head later. I don't care what she said. Don't give me no parking spot and don't give her one either. Oh, I'm in trouble. Don't give me no parking spot. Don't carry my water. Don't give me no armor bearers. Don't have somebody carrying my Bible. And, and, and unless I go blind or something, and if I do, I'll, I'll, I'll quit. But unless I go blind or something, I don't want to be one of them ones sitting over here talking about, read! Y'all ever see that? <laughs> Makes you wonder if they even literate, you know. So Jesus has some words that he wants to, to speak since he's in so much control. Now, we have seen in some cases that he would say something, give them some, condom, 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 uh, some commitment, that he would say something good about them. But here he's going to condemn them immediately. He's going to tell them they're dead. He says, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. All right, the King James is, is a little bit difficult to grasp what he's saying here. Um, when he says, I know your works, what comes after that is a description of what these works are doing. All right, the word that is an adverb. All right, so literally what he's saying here by using that is he's modifying a clause here, I know your works because of your works what he's saying is is that you have a name and that you are alive and this is because of your works if you're in an ESV it says I know your works period and then you have this sentence you have the reputation of being alive but you are dead that is a, a better way to actually translate it. It, it it helps a lot because when we look at works here what Christ is saying is he's saying that the works that they are doing they, they're leading to something so the activities that they're, they're into have, have caused something to take place. And so when he says they have a name, name here is referring to the fact that they have a reputation. They've made a name for themselves um, and that they have a reputation. And their reputation, this name that they've made for themselves, whoever likes that reputation believes that they are alive because of the reputation they have, which is because of the works that they do. Y'all get it? And so he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. Now, when he says that they are alive because of the use of the word zo in, in the original text, when normally when we see that, what he's referring to is spiritually alive. Now, I want y'all to get what's being said here. He's saying that because of the activities that you do, you have gained a reputation that makes somebody think you're spiritually alive but he says it's because of the works I got a question for you does God look at works or does he look at the heart and the intent the heart and the intent could you have an evil heart and do something that looks right most evil people do here's where we mess up because we give local churches reputations based on what they do. Very seldom do you hear someone say, you know, that church over there, boy, they teaching. We don't say that. We, we, don't, we don't look at it from that perspective. What deeds or works can a church do that would make it look spiritually alive? Now we're into activity. How about this? Because this is the way we think. Helping the needy. 
You have people that walk around and make, to me, statements that they have not thought through. I'm looking for a church. Oh, you're looking for a church. What do you want in a church? Well, I want a church that helps the needy. Why? Because if I, if I actually showed you what scripture said about helping the needy, it never put that on the church. It put that on you, on us. It put that on us to do. Uh, it, it never said that we were supposed to find somebody in need and run back to the church and say to the church, I found somebody in need. No, no, what, what, what Paul tells us through the aid of the Holy Spirit, meaning it came from God, is that if you see somebody in need and you got it, but we, we want that church that helps the needy. I, I guess that shields me from having to do anything. We, we look for the church, I love this one, working in the community. Well, what in the world does that mean? Working in the community to do what? Well, to help the needy. I'm looking for a church that does outreach, community service. Well, what does the community want? Typically, what the community wants is not salvation. They want an easier life. So what they look for from a church is, how can you make my life easier? Now, I want y'all to consider this for just a minute. Jesus said that if we came to him, if we gave our life to him, if we truly gave our lives to him, and if we were going to live Christ-like, that the world would hate us. So I'm going I'm to help the community get hated. I don't want that church. I want the church that's going to make my life better. Well, what's wrong with your life? The government. Yeah, yeah, y'all should. Some of y'all should be like, "Oh, yeah." It's the what, what's wrong with your life? It's the government. Biden ain't doing what he's supposed to do. Why, why, why? I ain't got the money I'm supposed to have. Well, we need to do what? I don't know. Vote. So it's the job of the church to organize votes. But hey, hold on, wait a minute. Most people will not fool with the church unless they are politically active. These are activities, and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm saying, so what is God saying about all of this? First of all, I hate to break this to you, but whoever gets in office, God's going to put him in there. Now, God says as a citizen, you should participate. Oh, vote, but accept whoever God puts in there. See, the problem with the church being active in that territory is the church starts to say some stupid stuff like we believe that God wants this person in. You don't know who God wants in there because you're going to define that based on some things that has nothing to do with the plans of God. Everybody in every government all over the world that is a leader was put in by God. I don't care who they are. I don't care how bad they are or how good they are. They were put in by God. He's sovereign. And if you want to know, well, why in the world would he put this kind of person in office? Because it all leads to something that's going to happen right here in the book of Revelation. It takes some evil folks to get to the point to where you're going to want one person to show up called an antichrist to take over. I have no problem with evil people in government. I don't because I understand what scripture is telling me. Now, is that the kind of church you want is one that is working in the community? Of course, because it's alive. Is it not? And they got outreach and they're doing things. But if God isn't looking at these things, who's looking at it? People. Oh yeah, Satan props it up but it's attractive to people. So people are the ones that make the reputation of the church. All right, so now listen carefully because I want you to understand how you know if your church is dead or alive. This is one way to tell as it comes to people. When everybody likes your church in the community, I'm talking about when unsaved people like your church, you probably dead. You probably dead. Because unsaved people don't like what Christians have to say. See, when you're alive as a, as a Christian, when you're alive and you are a Christian, the stuff you say will tick people off. Same-sex marriage is wrong. Oh, my goodness. 
Oh, you intolerant, you know what? Because we live in a woke society. I don't know what they woke up from, but they woke. Okay. Still wrong. If, if I don't believe, I didn't even say that. If I'm going to speak what the Bible says, no, I can't get with abortion. Doggone it. Talk about voting. Is that not a political issue? It shouldn't even be a political issue for someone that's a Christian. There ain't no political issue. It's just a fact. It's just, it's just, it's just God's way of saying, ain't right. It ain't right. Uh, it's just as bad as what it is, murder. End of the day, that's what it is. And if you're going to argue with that, I would say to you, why are you trying to be dead? Be alive. They're not going to like you. So when it comes to how we determine whether or not a church is alive or dead, we go by its size. That's the first thing. How many people are going there? That, that tells us one thing. Secondly, the activity. What are they doing? And we look at activities within and without because we want to go someplace where they got a program for everything. You know, my, my pinky toe was hurting the other day. We got a pinky toe ministry. We'll help your pinky toe. You know, we, we, we got that ministry. I need a Mother's Day out ministry. I'm sick and tired of my kids. I don't want to take care of them. I need the church to grab them and let me go out. And then I need my church to do community service. And community service centers around the urban problems of the community. And I'm going, I want my church to go out and fix them. And what everybody in the community needs is to be saved. Amen. Period. You can fix all the problems and everybody just go to hell. And what good have we done? Not a thing. So when we look at this church, what he's saying is, I, I know your works and they gave you a reputation. And you, 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 you got this reputation and everybody thinks you're spiritually alive. Then he says, but. Now, this morning, when we were in Bible study, I had, to, I had to ask the question, what is the most important word in the verse? I'm telling you, the most important word in this verse is the word but. Because but means forget all that. Because here's the, here's the deal. You are necros, dead. Dead to who? Dead to me. I don't care if the community thinks you're alive. I don't care if you got a good reputation. I don't care when you run out on the field, you got a star on your helmet and they cheering for you. You ain't won nothing in 30 years. You're dead. God is not a fan. He's a realist. He deals with reality. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't deal in what could be. He deals in what is. You are dead. And he says, I have a remedy for you. Verse 2. King James says, be watchful. In the ESV, it says, wake up. I like wake up. Here's what spiritual death looks like. You asleep. You, you're focused in on the wrong thing. He's saying, I know you're, sp you're spiritually dead and you should know it because you're considering and looking at your activities to determine your own way of thinking whether or not we are alive. It's, it's bad when a church looks at its activities to determine whether or not it's alive. That is not going to help you determine whether or not you are alive. Now, remember, the one that's speaking is the one that has the Holy Spirit. He has the Holy Spirit. And I have a question. Does the church itself as a whole have the Holy Spirit? The answer is it can't because it's dead. And so you have to ask yourself a question. Then what is it? What is it? How do you know when you have the Holy Spirit? So I'm going to help you. When, when you I want you all to really listen carefully. Listen very carefully. See, when you have the Holy Spirit, what you speak will be holy. Y'all catch what I just said? Y'all may have missed it. So let me put it to you another way. When a church has the Holy Spirit, 
All right? And I, oh, I don't like this. When I hear people say it's a spirit-filled church, I'm like, okay, determined by what? And then they go by activity again because they in there jumping. And you can jump and shout. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But just because you're jumping and shouting don't mean it's a spirit-filled church. That means it's an emotional church. That means people like to jump and shout, but that don't mean it's spirit-filled. You know what spirit-filled means? Spirit-filled means it's obedient. Spirit-filled means it's in the word. Spirit-filled means everything centers around what the Holy Spirit is bringing back to remembrance, which comes from where? His word. It means that the teaching is right. It means that the people are paying attention to the teaching. It means the teaching is effective. It means that the teaching will bother you. It's effective. It, it's, it's bothering you. The teaching doesn't make you feel good all the time. Y'all don't know. I love it when y'all say this to me. Where's the joy? Oh, thank you, Jesus. We're punching here. Let's punch this sin up out of us. Because that's what your word is going to do. It's going to put us in conflict with ourselves. Ain't that what Paul was trying to tell us in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans? The things I want to do. I don't the things I don't want to do I do oh wretched man that I am but I see a truth within me there is a battle going on in my flesh see when the church is alive it causes the church individuals to have some battles go on it's you're listen to me carefully you know your church is alive when you have them moments where you go, man, this this kind of kind of make me sick. You have them moments when, yeah, you get mad at me. <laughs> That's all right. That lets me know I'm saying something right. <laughs> Some, something's coming out right. It, it's, it's coming out right. But if you're going and, and, and where you go every time you go and, and if you're never convicted, you never want to make a change. Now, now, let me explain this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen carefully. You want to make a change because you understand their sin and that's a problem. Not you want to make a change so you can get to the next level of your financial success. No, uh-uh, no. I mean, if you want that, go see Tony Robbins you know go to rise you know they, they, they got a bunch of them three days they'll, they'll help you rise up financially no it's, it's when you realize you are not perfect it's when you realize you can't blame it on the devil it's when you realize it's me that, that's when now you're like now I can make this change because I'm convicted is when you stop blaming everybody else. I got a question for y'all because I, I want to know. How often have y'all heard me say it was because of Satan that you are the way you are? The devil did not make me do it. The devil has never made me do anything. That's right. He cannot. He can't. And the beautiful thing in that is the first step to your recovery is recognizing you're the problem that's the first step to the recovery I have a problem see if Satan has a problem it ain't me so he says be watchful or wake up turn your focus around and strengthen the things which remain Ooh, which means there are some things that are still hanging around from the beginning and then he's going to tell us what they are he says they remain but they are ready to die it's, it, he's telling them y'all are at the precipice where if, if y'all don't go back and recapture this this, this thing is going to fall on off the cliff that you're on now I, I want y'all to get what he's saying to this church he's saying to this church you're dead but you don't have to be you're dead but there is there's an opportunity for you here he says for I have not found your works perfect before God now the Greek word plerao here, um, um, the way it is written, when he says perfect here, what he's saying is I, I, it's not complete, meaning that you, you haven't done everything you're supposed to be. Now understand what he's saying. He's saying to them that there's still some life there. 
There's something that you need to hang on to. And by the way, when I look at your works, you haven't completed everything I needed you to complete. By the way, this helps you to understand that God never intended for local churches to just perpetuate themselves. Not necessarily. He, hey, he got a specific work for that church and when it's, when you've completed, you've completed it. I, I, it must be that way because we got too many. Church all over the place. Churches everywhere. And so you got, so it's, he's saying there are some things I have for you in Sardis that you need to do. I have not found your works perfect or completed before God. So he says, this is what I want you to do. This is what you have to do. This is what remains. Remember. This should remind you of the church at Ephesus when he said, remember and repent. He says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. You'll see the words received and heard. Every time you see received and heard when you go through the New Testament, you know what it's talking about? The gospel. He's saying, remember how you got the gospel in the beginning. This tells us that when the gospel first came to Sardis and this church started, they were on fire. 30 years have passed now what's left is tradition I grew up this thing gonna say amen in a traditional church when you grow up in a traditional church when it comes to the word of God that's an afterthought I didn't realize it till I got out of the church I didn't realize it uh, literally until I got to seminary and realized how important God's word was. Everything that we had the gospel, but it was it wasn't emphasized. I don't know how to explain it. It, it was there wasn't there was this whole thing of everything was tradition. It was more in line with what Sunday is this and, and what should we be wearing? It was more in line with is this an annual day? And, and we went looking from one annual day to the next annual day. So the Sundays in between, it was just same old routine. And I didn't even realize, even, and I hate that, Lord knows I'm, I'm saying this, and, and someone's going to say, man, should you say that publicly? I'll say it publicly because it's just the truth. The truth of the matter was the sermons we were getting, it was the same sermon over and over. It really was because all we ever got was Jesus at the cross. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what they would say in the beginning because whatever they said in the beginning didn't line up with what scripture was saying. They didn't explain scripture. But, but what I got a lot of because it was traditional was to start talking about Friday. Friday. Right now, right now, there are churches that are looking forward to next week. It's, it's like the biggest thing of the year. It's going to be Friday. Because on Friday, they're going to have service. And when they have that service, they're going to have the seven last saints. I've participated in the seven last things. I'm going to say this publicly. I will, I don't, I'll say this. What I came to understand after doing it a couple of times was this was not about Jesus. This was a competition. Which of you preachers that stands up in these seven last things is going to get the best reaction? Now I'm looking back at that. I'm going dead because I know it's dead because Jesus is not involved. And when Jesus is not the focal point, it's dead. I mean, how many next Sunday, next Sunday, are going to have that pageant? I love it, though. You know, when I was a kid, I hated it. Because my grandmother had me in them patent leather shoes. I remember when leisure shoes were out when I was a kid. And You come down in that hot leisure suit and it was always 100 degrees and you had to walk down there and somebody on a microphone talking about look at little Kevin. <laughs> look at the shine on them shoes and he's got on a green suit with an orange shirt. You know, and I'm, you're a kid, you're like, what is it? What? And now I'm looking back at it and I'm asking myself, what did Jesus have to do with any of this? Any of this? And then we gave a first prize. Oh yeah, yeah, it's deep. It was deep. It was deep. It was important. He says, remember therefore how you have received and heard. He's talking about the gospel. And he says, hold fast and repent. 
Hold fast. Hold fast to the gospel. What's important? My gospel is important. Not your traditions. That's not important. Traditions are fine if you understand what they are. If you understand they don't equal scripture. If, if you have a tradition that on this annual day, all women are going to wear red and a lady walks in in black, you all should not look at her like she's crazy. But we see that happening. And you have to ask yourself a question. Is this church alive or is it dead? Because what does it matter if she didn't know or forgot to wear her red dress? Or when you walk in and people start looking, well, the choir don't wear robes. Or when people come in here, I got to use the right word, and we don't have pews. I have to use that word. Yeah, I'm going to stay there. All right, and you, and you don't have pews, and it's like, oh, it's something wrong. We have deadened the church through tradition. And, and what he tells this church is, you all need to remember where you come from go back to the beginning then he says repent I like this remember therefore how you have heard and hold fast and then he tells them that they need to repent change your mind not your deeds notice he didn't tell them to change their activities there was nothing wrong with the activities is there anything wrong with being some service to the community no but when that's your focus and it's not Christ you have a problem. Their mind is what's wrong. It's their thoughts that's what's wrong. By the way, when you get saved, if, you, if, if anyone ever says to you, well, what does it really mean to be saved? Two things. Number one, I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from hell. That, that, that's the main one. I ain't burning. Everybody can anybody say amen? I ain't burning. I ain't burning. Number two, I'm saved from my mind. Because my mind ain't right. Understand, before you were saved, your mind did not recognize God. That's crazy. I was insane. And the problem with me now is even though now I recognize God, sometimes I slip into insanity. Thank you, Lord, that I'm continually being saved. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that doesn't wipe me out when I slip back into that insanity. So he says here, I got, I got a warning for you. I got a warning for you. I got a warning for you. He says, therefore, if you will not watch, if you won't wake up, I will come upon you as a thief. Who in here has been robbed? Not at gunpoint. Not at gunpoint. You've been robbed, though. You, someone's come in and stole. They, they stole from you. How do you know that they've stolen from you? Because it's missing. <laughs> He, he said thief. That's a thief. See, robbers might rob you in your face. But a thief takes and is gone. And by the time you realize that you had a thief, it's after it's gone. I remember uh, one Sunday we went out to eat. And I know the darties are going to be like, oh, my gosh. We went out to eat, had a good time. We was just doing really good. Came out, and, man, somebody stole the, what, the seats? Stole the seats out of their SUV. I had never heard of such a thing. I mean, the seats were gone. Big old parking lot. Another restaurant right across the way, and ain't nobody seen nothing. That's, a, that's, that's real thievery. That's what thieves do. You find out after the fact. When you look at what he's saying here, when he says, I will come up on you as a thief, what he's saying is, I'm going to come up on you so quickly, but by the time you realize I've showed up, it's too late. It's, it's too late. Now, there's some eschatological thinking here that's going on because when he comes like this is actually at his second coming. That's the time when he says, no one knows. He's like, so what he's saying is, and, and this is for us as a church universal, he's saying, for those of you that, that, uh, that don't have my spirit, you're dead. And, and here's what's going to happen. While you are doing church activities, oh, you showing up, and you active, you on the board, 
you leading the ministry you preaching the sermons I'm going to show up and you're going to be like huh what happened I'm going to come like a thief this means judgment I'm going to come in before you know it and then he says and you will not know what hour I come upon you I'm a real thief it's going to have happened you're going to be like what in the world happened mm 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 so he says let me give you some motivation verse 4 you have a few names even in Sardis now when he says few names he didn't say he does not say you have a few with a name a reputation he says you got a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments that means that within that church there's some that aren't saved God always has a remnant that's one thing he always does he keeps a remnant but I want you to understand he's saying most everybody in this church is not saved they're doing church stuff though that should really help you to understand that it doesn't matter what you see a group doing that doesn't mean everybody's saved however hopefully there is a remnant he says now, now, now look at this you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments remember I said that one of the things that, this, that Sardis was known for was what dying wool so dyed garments but the garment that you're going to dye begins white and then you add dye to it now when you add something to something that's pure you defile it so he's using here the contrast of what Sardis is known for to help them to understand something he's saying those that are in the church that are doing church activities even though they look like they are pure they've defiled themselves they've added some dye to it all right so he says those that 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 are saved they have not defiled their garments and and they shall walk with me when this is present tense they walk with me in white for they are worthy now you, you got to catch this he's saying because I know a lot of us are looking for white robes later but what he's saying is symbolically if you're saved right now there's two things going on number one you're pure because you're in white as far as I see you right now you're already in white y'all are missing this you're, you're missing this it's like you already have your ticket to get in even though you haven't got in yet you already have your ticket have you ever uh, gone to a sporting event or you've gone to a concert and you got your tickets you, you know when on your way there you what you happy you already got your seat right you, you got your seat you're happy on your way imagine if you're going and you know that it's probably sold out and you ain't got no ticket but you done decided you're going to find a way to get in anyway first thing you know is it's going to cost me a grip that's, that's the first thing you know secondly you don't even know if it's legit and you won't find out until you get to the door do you know it's a whole lot of Christians that live their lives thinking that way I'm going to get to heaven and hopefully Peter will let me in I don't know why they made Peter a doorkeeper in the first place. Peter ain't never had that kind of authority anyway. I mean, either you in or you're not. Either you got a ticket or you don't. And God don't have no will call booth. I've gone through that. I paid online. It's at the will call booth. They ain't got my name. Y'all took my money. Let me get my phone out. Why I can't get no... Y'all got Wi Fi? <laughs> walk with me. Walk. Wait, hold on. This is present tense. I know it says, and they shall. shall. It's actually in the present tense. Those that have not defiled the garments, they walk with him. We walk with him now. now, now. That, what that means is you actually have communion with Christ right now. Now, here's the thing. Um, you ever walk in a crowd of people but you're with a significant other right so you're aware that they're there with you you know this happens like especially when you go to a crowded place like a, like a sporting event or to an airport um, and you got to keep up with your family you're aware because you're focused in but if you lose focus Asia used to do me like this I would lose focus and Asia would stop walking <laughs> and I'd walk 20 or 30 feet and I turn around, say you. Then I turn around, she's standing there. 
a lot of us walk with Jesus like that we lose focus we don't even realize he's there for us he's saying wake up because you can walk with me right now stop waiting till you get to heaven when you got me right now I know what you're saying how do I walk with him right now have you ever opened up your Bible Amen. begin to walk and then pray talk to him you could be like my grandmother she used to sing it at night he walks with me and he talks with me what does he do granny he tells me I am his own she used to go to sleep singing that at night I didn't understand I understand now I get it I get to walk with him and then he says something here that's, that's really beautiful he says for they are worthy oh wait a minute Lord I am not worthy to walk with you he said I know you ain't but I'm going to make you worthy not because you got merit to be worthy but because I'm making you worthy the fact that I'm stopping and saying walk with me is me telling you I've made you worthy no you didn't earn it no you shouldn't be able to but I put me on you so you could walk with me why are you missing out on this wake up then he says in verse 5 he says now he who overcomes now please understand the overcomer according to what scripture tells us over in John the overcomer is the one that has given their life to Christ because what you've overcome is death so the overcomer is the saved person so this is the motivation for those who are saved he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments now he connects this back to verse 4 he says right now you're walking in white garments there will come a time when you will be able to actually see the garment that I'm going to put on you and I will oh whoa wait a minute wait a minute and I will not blot out his name from the book of life All right, I know a lot of y'all are sitting here like the book of life the book of life y'all see the words blot out it, it's funny um, it, this, this could mean it could mean that, that because your name is in the book of life it'll never be erased but, but I come from the perspective of this if, if that were the case you would just say my name is in there now this does not mean you can lose your salvation everybody open your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 32 you really need to understand what's going on here Exodus chapter 32 find verse 31 I promise we, 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 we're almost through we're almost there we're getting close we're going to say hallelujah and get out Exodus 32 everybody there Exodus is a big book I hope you can find it Exodus 32 verse 31 now this is where Moses has a problem because he's come down with the Ten Commandments and when he comes down with the Ten Commandments they done made a golden calf and so he knows God's ready to kill everybody so Moses comes back up then Moses returns to the Lord and said oh these people have committed a great sin and have made for this themselves a God of gold look at verse 32 yet now if you will forgive their sin but if not I pray blot me out of your book which you have written now I want you to look at the next part and the Lord said to Moses whoever has sinned against me I will blot him out of my book there's an indication here because God wished that all would be saved that the way God has done this is before the foundation of the world he put everybody in the book come to Psalms chapter 20 and find verse 15 I mean um, Psalms chapter 16 I'm sorry um, Psalms number 69 verse 28 Psalm 69 28 Just to, just, to, just to kind of solidify what I'm trying to tell you. Everybody there? Psalm 69? Look at verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Again, this is telling me that God puts everybody in the book. Everybody is in the book. Now, when you die, if you have not given yourselves over to him, and you end up in hell somewhere somehow you're erased from the book now turn to Revelation 20 and I'm going to show you what that looks like for those that get erased from the book and when you see this you're going to say my 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 let me know when you're there all right go to Revelation 20 verse 11 it's a great white throne 
Then I saw the great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books were open. Notice there's books, plural. And another book was open, which is the book of life. So we got books and a book. All right. Okay. And the dead were judged. Who was dead? Who was judged? The dead. Because those that are alive have already been judged. The dead were judged according to their works. Let me tell you where those who are alive, those who are alive are behind the throne. We're watching. All right. By the things which were written in the books, plural. So they get judged by their works. And let me tell you, you don't want God judging you by your works. Okay. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into this thing called the lake of fire. Oh, uh, you mean hell ain't permanent? Nope. No, there's something worse. The lake of fire. This is the second death. This is your final death. This is the death that is completely separate from God. And verse 15 is the killer. And anyone not found written in the book of life, So if I'm coming to the great white throne and he's got these books and he's showing me my works, this is what you did good, this is what you did bad, and I'm looking at him, I can't at that point appeal to him and say, can I get some grace? Can you, can you help a brother out? I did do that. Did I build that hospital? You did. Did I not give of myself? Yeah, you did yes you did well can I get in please uh, let me check book of life let's see yes your name would be right about here mm. there's an empty space where it was you've been blotted out I got some motivation my name is in the book it won't be blotted out. That right there should move me to a place where I'm, I'm looking at those who I know your name is going to be blotted out. If you don't get God before you die, I ought to be motivated to get them to make sure that your name is not blotted out of this book. And he's given me some things that I can say to you. Do you not understand? I am walking in purity right now. And I know they'll look at me and say, but oh, Kevin, I've seen you do ABC. Yeah, but he don't. Oh, you, you missed it. He covered me. And thank goodness, because if he, ooh, I'd be blotted. You don't want to be blotted out this book. Come back over to Revelation uh, chapter 3 real quick and catch the end of what he says here. He says, I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name. You got to understand, Jesus saying, I'm going to be proud of you. You know when Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. Let me tell you who's ashamed of him, those that won't give their lives to him. That's who's ashamed. He's not going to, listen, listen, listen. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Do you understand that God is going to confess your name? That, that Jesus is going to say your name before, before the Father and the angels. And remember, we were made below the angels. He, he's going to publicize my, I know what you're saying. Uh, well, but yeah, what, what, uh, how many Kevins is he going to, oh, y'all forgot. In the last church, I got a new name that nobody else knew and it's only mine. I'm the only one that got it. I'm so unique. I got my own name that is going to be publicized. And not to the rest of you lowlifes. No, but it's going to be publicized before the Father in heaven. It's going to be publicized before the angelic beings. I mean, Michael going to look at me and go, that's that dude. That's that guy right there. That right there ought to be enough motivation that you can understand he who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Get up off your tail and wake up. Make sure we don't die. God bless you. All right, let's stand. For our visitors, we don't open the doors of the church here because I'm still, I've been looking and I keep trying, I can't find where I had the right to open a shuttle. So they're open. 
If you don't know Christ, the doors are open. You can come to him. And what you need to do, if you feel a tugging at your heart, talk to one of the members. Talk to any other Christian. They should be able to help you. If they can't, then come to us. Then leadership will get you where you need to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand that what we think is alive may not be. But what you say is alive is connected to you. What you say is alive has your Holy Spirit. So we understand that if your Holy Spirit wrote your word, then those of us who are alive would be in it. We would be in it and we'd be talking to you because you walk with me. And you do talk with me. And I can have that right now. That's just amazing. The God of the universe and I can walk together. So thank you for that, Lord. And then you said, but I am not, I'm not stopping there. The day will come when I, I will personally put you in a white robe. I will personally give you a name. I will personally stand up and say your name before my father and the angels in heaven. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. My future is bright. It's mighty bright. So I pray, Lord, that our ears are open, that we do hear. And then, Father, that we do go out and we explain this to people, that we let the world know that they have this opportunity. There's no reason for them to remain dead. Thank you for your gospel. There's no reason for them to remain dead. So our prayer is simple. Help us to be the kind of people you'd have us to be, to go out and to present your gospel to those out there that they might come into the knowledge of the truth and they too can walk with you in purity and look forward to what they will receive. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus.